welcome here. Welcome Zoomers. Glad you're with us this morning. Grace and peace be yours in fullest measure. Prepare as we worship God this morning. Uh, I would like to call your attention to the announcements uh, in the bulletin. A uh, couple of additional announcements. Uh, first, uh, Zuzu uh, is selling stickers to raise money for suicide prevention efforts. Uh, they're five dollars each, and if you can find her after the service, I know she'd appreciate that. Uh, in addition, uh, in the concerns the Poole families noted, uh, as you know, baby Chloe uh, was born this past week, and we've got great news to share uh, in that she did not need heart surgery after all. All was good. Apparently, there had been some kind of false read on the prenatal echo, and uh, she's gone home with mom, dad, and brothers. So, uh, joys and celebrations. If you've got other announcements or joys and concerns, I want to pass them along to uh, Jen or me during the service. Uh, we can include that during the time of prayer. So please join me in the call to worship as printed in the, the bulletin. And one note, too, is uh, there's, there's a mix-up in the order. Uh, we have him 20 after uh, the call to worship. We don't immediately go into the confession song, so that, that's out of order. Um, so God's eyes are on God's creatures. God's ears are let us worship the one who clothes us in strength. And
please be seated. And in my zeal to get to the call uh, to worship, a few other announcements that were left out. Of. Our pastor is on vacation uh, this week, as you've probably figured out by now. Uh, she's returning early this week, and we'll be back in the pulpit next Sunday. In addition, please register your attendance through the Ritual of Friendship pads, as well as in the chat box on Zoom. Now, trusting in God's grace, we come to a time of confession. Let us sing together our prayer of confession. Please follow along as I read the prayer for illumination. Faithful God, how blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Sanctify us by your word and spirit so that we may glorify you in the company of the faithful through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The first reading this morning is from Joshua. 24. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah, and his sons, Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Now therefore, revere the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Pull away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. Now if you're unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors that they served in the region beyond the river of the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along the way, along the way that we went and among all the peoples whom we passed. 
And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. The word of God. Let us join in the psalm. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers, to cut off the remembrances of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears them and rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. He keeps all their bones. One of them will be broken. Evil brings death to the wicked. And those who hate the righteousness will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. said, Amen. Thank you, Brad and Ann, for your gifts. The gospel lesson this morning is from John, and as we learned from Becky last Sunday, I guess this is the fourth or fifth installment as we proceed uh, through these challenging passages. Um, starting with the 56th verse of book six, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of the disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. 
For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that was to betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went with him. So Jesus, Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The reading from the Gospel. The epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, and this also continues uh, passages that we've been reading in the last few weeks. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. And with all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert, and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. The word of the Lord. You have me again, I'm back like a bad penny. And after Brad's anthem, I think that everything I'm about to, m to say is probably a mistake. So just like uh, take it all with a big old grain of, of salt. I can speak extemporaneously, but not in this setting. So I'm just, I'm going to uh, say what I prepared and uh, yeah. pray, pray also for me so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. <clears throat> Today's texts were, I think, designed to rub me the wrong way. The lectionary offers two choices for the Old Testament readings, one from Kings where Solomon dedicates the new temple with lots of triumphalist discourse, and the one we just heard from Joshua, which is sort of a throwdown. Are you going to be on the side of the best God or some other lesser God? The two listed psalms for today are also triumphalist, and even the gospel is creepy in a different way, making the metaphor at the heart of the Eucharist all too literal. Then we have the passage from Ephesians where Paul tells his folks to gird up for battle. This reading I discovered in studying commentaries on the various scriptures for the week is a favorite of preachers, particularly of the variety who like to imagine that American Christians are a persecuted minority. We, we love competition, and we especially love winning. I don't see myself as particularly prone to this love, but when the Olympics were on earlier this month, Zuzu and I had the TV going for many hours a day instead of our usual zero. I cheered on the American teams in various sports, but also the French team handball team, the Hungarian eight-woman skull crew, an Israeli rhythmic gymnast, people from unknown countries riding horses from unknown countries. If I like to see someone cross the finish line first, even if I don't much care who it is, I have to think that a taste for competition may be hardwired in humans. I will forget about all these sports until the next Olympics because I don't really care about sports. So <laughs> if I'm scaring my cats while cheering on swimmers, you have to think it's innate somehow. 
But even as I'm terrifying my poor kitties, who is this strange new gen and what does she do with our human? I'm also standing outside myself observing and thinking that it is totally nuts to be caught up in the javelin throw or kayak slalom. I'm, I'm, I, we, we literally watched every sport that was available, um, <laughs> including ones I had to look up because I did not know what they were, like the, the ones in the velodrome. It, it, it's re they're, re they're fascinating, incomprehensible unless you look them in Wikipedia. <laughs> I'm suspicious of that urge to say we're number one because it isn't always as harmless as hoping the underdog marathoner will pull out a surprise victory. In America in particular, we have a long history of seeing ourselves as the apple of God's eye, while other people are just somehow not as deserving as we are. Historically in America, dominant groups see themselves as especially qualified to rule over others. We are seeing the fallout from those beliefs in our current politics as we witness the outspoken resistance to multiracial democracy by a minority of Americans who think that they and they alone are qualified to vote and govern. Political science professor Liliana Mason of the University of Maryland identifies this group as a faction that has existed in American polity since our nation's earliest days, a group that is not consistently aligned with any political party, but shifts its allegiances to target parties as it seeks a white Christian nationalism. She writes that this group can be recruited from either party and responds especially well to hatred of marginalized groups. This group does not agree that all qualified voters should have equal rights to cast a vote or that all qualified votes should count. Mason labels this faction anti-democratic because it is invested in its own rule rather than in the power sharing that is fundamental to democracy. This faction sees history in triumphalist ways, like those reflected in the Hebrew scriptures for today. And it sees itself as specially selected by God for this triumphalism. No surprise, then, at my discomfort. Juliana Classens argues a different way to read these scriptures, however, not as triumphalism, but as attempts to suggest a narrative to a traumatized people. That is, Joshua restates facts that everyone in his audience knows, but he casts them in a particular narrative that he hopes his audience will accept. She writes, the group agrees upon a way to explain their past trauma in a way that leads to a unified approach to living life in future. The newly narrated past creates the possibilities of a new future. Out of the people's weakness and trauma emerges a story in which God has always been present, caring for the people and guiding them toward a better future. Trauma can lead to selfishness, to self-protection at the expense of the common good. Joshua offers the people a choice of fragmentation or unity, reminding them of God's goodness by simply mentioning that their ancestors and neighbors worship other gods and asking them to choose. Do you want the gods from beyond the Euphrates, the gods of Egypt, the gods of the Amorites whose land we're on now? Joshua tells them, my household and I, we're sticking with the Lord. And the people respond, yeah, the God who brought us out of Egypt, who protected us in the desert, who did great signs for us. We'll stick with the Lord too. It's a new founding for Israel, like what Eric Foner calls the second founding of the United States after the Civil War, when the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution attempted to make real a country in which all men are created equal. Israel's new founding, like ours, presents a hopeful look to the future. It imagines that the problems of the past can be safely consigned to the rearview mirror because the people have learned from their experiences and have put in place new systems to help bring that better future into being. That's what the post-Civil War amendments did, too. They said, we've tried whites-only democracy, and it created a huge problem for the nation, the injustice of slavery, which led to this great civil war that we've just suffered through. Let's try democracy that's all of us in this together. As Abraham Lincoln said, the Civil War was a test of whether any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. The second founding wasn't a perfect imagining of America. Native Americans were still excluded, women didn't have the right to vote, and not all Americans were on board with the idea of multiracial democracy. Republicans had to push these amendments through on a party-line basis. Even worse, this new promise for America was short-lived. 
That faction of white supremacists and anti-democracy fans were soon after able to end Reconstruction and push us into the long, dark night of Jim Crow segregation and disenfranchisement. For Israel, that mountaintop look into the future represented possibilities, not certainties. It was up to the Hebrew people to make those possibilities real, just like it's still up to us to make multiracial democracy real in America. Again, Lincoln from the Gettysburg Address. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. In contrast to the triumphalism of the arrival of the Hebrew people in their new homeland, Paul's injunction to put on the whole armor of God certainly sounds like a call to militant action. The body armor that Paul describes, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, is individual, although obviously, if all of an army's forces are protected in this way, the military unit has a better chance of victory. I'm not a big fan of crusades, and even thinking about this armoring up as being a defense against evil doesn't really do it for me. I've seen human beings do a number of rotten things in my lifetime, and I don't really need a supernatural explanation for why. I found a number of fundamentalist readings of this passage that see it as a literal call to arms, a demand for Christians to fight and defeat our spiritual enemies, who are also our political enemies. In Pope Francis's encyclical Fratelli Tutti, Francis argues that it's possible to decide not to continue a cycle of violence, to choose not to exact retribution on someone who has harmed you. But he writes, it's not possible to feel that mercy coincides with justice unless everyone is clear on the facts that led to the need for mercy. Truth, in other words, must be the partner of justice and mercy. He writes that kindness frees us from the cruelty that at times infects human relationships, from the anxiety that prevents us from thinking of others, from the frantic flurry of activity that forgets that others also have the right to be happy. Kindness, of course, is one of the fruits of the Spirit Paul describes in his letter to the Galatians. Francis suggests that precisely because it entails esteem and respect for others, once kindness becomes a culture within society, it transforms lifestyles, relationships, and the ways ideas are discussed and compared. The whole encyclical is aimed at reminding those with power, including politicians, the wealthy, citizens of rich countries, and others who can choose to ignore the plight of less favored persons, that we are all in this together and that we have responsibilities toward others. This is an idea that I worry is almost extinct in America. We are such fans of individualism that we have struggled to confront the pandemic in healthy ways because doing so means accepting that my actions affect others and therefore my actions should be constrained by concern for other people. For some people, learning that masking protects others as much as or even more than it protects ourselves has been reason enough not to do it. Our foreign policy, too, often fails to see the United States as one among many nations, and that leads us to mistreat friends and allies, as well as to fail to see how other countries understand our actions. Our failure to think of ourselves as part of Team Human leads us to errors that harm even the narrow self-interest we claim to pursue. If we think of Paul's extended metaphor, English professors would call it a conceit, as just a way to make accessible to his audience the idea Paul really wants to convey, perhaps it can be a little more meaningful to us. What will protect us is not really armor, but God's gifts and virtues. It's not a call to military action, but a call to remember the gifts we already have, the gifts that sustain us and give us courage to act in love for others. This passage reminds me of St. Patrick's Breastplate, a prayer recorded in the ninth century and attributed to the saint who converted Ireland to Christianity. The prayer follows a druidic formula, so the pattern of it is even older than the fragmentary version recorded in an early life of Patrick. 
The saint supposedly wrote it for protection when he was headed into a part of Ireland where the Druid priests were waiting in ambush for him, and it must have worked because he emerged alive, according to legend, because a magical mist appeared and concealed him from his murderous foes. We have a version in our hymnal, hymn, hymn six, if you want to look it up. Brad, you look it up. We'll sing it next week. We're, we're not going to sing it today because the last time we tried it didn't go well. It has, because of the scanning of the, the prayer, it uses two different tunes. And the first tune, which is a well-known tune, you only sing part of the first time through. And um, it goes to a third page in our hymnal, and nobody turned. And so... <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, we tried. Our hearts were in the right place. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the prayer takes the form of invocations, binding, <clears throat> binding various protections to the speaker, invoking the powers of the earth, the powers of God, Christ's history. It asks that Christ be with the speaker, but also in the eyes and ears and hearts of others. We will sing a modernized version of this prayer in a little bit. Is called a breastplate or lorica because it is a talismanic invocation of protections for the speaker. That sense of protection seems to me what Paul is talking about. As today's psalm reminds us, things are going to happen, but God is always with you. And because God is always with you, you can meet whatever challenges arise. With this armor, you will be able to proclaim the gospel of peace. Your shield of faith will quench the flaming arrows of the evil one. Your individual armor protects you, but it does so to enable you to do what's right, to stand for others. In other words, it doesn't have to be about competition all the time. It can be about kindness and mutuality. One of the best moments of the Olympics for me was when the high jumpers from Gutter and Italy, tied for first place at the end of the competition, were being instructed about the upcoming jump off to determine first and second place. The jumper from Gutter said, can we have two golds? Instant classic Olympic moment. Everyone was happy, both of them won. Our relations don't all have to be about dominance and ranking. In fact, we already know that our most precious relationships are not about that at all. In our family life, for instance, relations of mutual love and support lead to happier outcomes than do relations of domination. The whole armor of God allows us to look beyond our immediate interests and see a good that everyone can share in. It enables the courage to stand up for those who don't have our power or privilege. It inspires attention to the common good, to living up to our best ideals. It permits us to resist the evil that suggests that we are isolated from one another and to see ourselves instead, adopted children of God, equally bathed in God's grace and love. Amen.
be seated. Well, probably seated you too soon, but stay there and join me in the affirmation of faith. <laughs> we confess and acknowledge one God alone, to whom alone we must cleave, whom alone we must serve, whom only we must worship, and in whom alone we put our trust who is eternal, infinite, immeasurable, incomprehensible, omnipotent, invisible, one in substance and yet distinct in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, by whom we confess and believe all things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, to have been created, to be retained in their being, and to be ruled and guided by his inscrutable providence for such end as his eternal wisdom, goodness, and justice have appointed, and the manifestation of his own glory. We come now to a time of prayer, prayers of the people, uh, and as when I say God of abundant grace, we respond, hear our prayer. In our trouble and need, we look to the Lord, the giver of our daily bread, saying, God of abundant grace, we pray for our church. By the power of your spirit and word, help us to speak more boldly of the mystery of the gospel. God of abundant grace, prayer. we pray for the world. Teach the leaders of this in every land to put aside all falsehood and corruption and to seek your ways of justice and peace. God of abundant grace, we pray for this community. Let this place become your dwelling place, a safe shelter for strangers and refugees, a place of promise and peace for all. God of abundant grace, we pray for loved ones, we pray for those listed in our church's prayer concerns. Speak tenderly to those who are hurting. Encourage them through your healing word, the word that brings the dead to life. God of abundant grace, your prayers. Generous God, as you provide for us each day, nourish and strengthen us in faith and faithfulness so that we may share your grace in a hungry world. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Amen. We now appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to present yourselves at this time of offering as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, and let us offer our lives and gifts to the Lord.
dedicate these gifts. We give you thanks and praise, O oh God, for you have chosen the poverty of the world to make your people rich in faith. Help us to put our faith into practice through the offering of our lives, giving food to the hungry, clothes to the naked, and shelter to the poor. All for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, your word made flesh. Amen. Blessed is Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus is the Holy One you sent to us to proclaim your word of eternal life, and we've come to follow and trust in him. Take away the chains of evil that bind us and wrap us in the armor of your grace so that we may stand firm in our faith through Lord Jesus Christ. In the unity of the Spirit, we bless you, God of glory, now and forever. Now, as children of God, we are bold to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. worthy of your calling, giving glory to God in all things. Amen. Amen. Now stand firm in your faith, covered by the saving grace of God, 
and ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. Amen. Amen.